My name is Jessica Gorman, and I'm um, not a clinician, <laughs> just by way of introduction. All of my training and background is in public health. Um, so I feel um, I've really enjoyed this conference so far. And um, it's interesting that a lot of what I'm planning to talk about today has already been discussed in one way or another um, from some of the presenters. So I hope that it's not too much of a broken record, um, but maybe it helps reinforce some of the things that have been discussed already and maybe bring some new insight and ideas as well. So laying out what I hope to talk with you all about in my 20-minute uh, time slot here is, first of all, to talk about what do we mean by quality of life for adolescent and young adult survivors and then look at um, some of the outcomes, uh, what we know about quality of life for this population. Talk a little bit about some of my research with reproductive and sexual health concerns um, as related, as we've been hearing a lot about these past couple of days as related to quality of life. And then begin thinking about some possible approaches to improving quality of life in this population. So we know that AYA survivors are a unique population, right? Um, and they have a really wide age range, so age 15 to 39. Obviously, what someone is thinking about and going through in life is very different at age 15 and age 25 and age 39. Um, we know that the needs of, of this group are, are not um, adequately addressed. We're beginning to really understand what some of those needs are, but don't necessarily address them very well. And this means that they, along with their partners, family, caregivers, need to navigate a system that doesn't necessarily meet their needs across the cancer continuum. Um, so meaning from the time of diagnosis onward well into survivorship. And again, a reminder that since this population is so diverse and we can think about age, cancer type, life stages, um, that there isn't really a one size fits all solution when we're thinking about improving quality of life for this population. And a reminder again, we've heard a little bit of this, right? Life doesn't return to normal after cancer treatment ends, and this is true for the AYA survivor population as well. So I thought it'd be helpful to give a definition of health-related quality of life. So just to emphasize that this is a really broad concept, it's a multi-dimensional concept, including physical, mental, emotional, and social functioning. Um, and impact on health status or the impact of health status on all of those different domains so that's a very broad concept right and this I put together um, when thinking about quality of life for AYA survivors to kind of pull out some key concepts so um, around the circle there of quality of life are some different things that we know are important to quality of life for AYA survivors. So this includes reproductive and sexual health, education, careers, work, relationships, peers, the finances, insurance, as well as management of ongoing health issues that can happen, um, you know, for going forward into survivorship. And that we can imagine that these different priorities are things that would impact on quality of life might change over time. They might change across the stage of cancer treatment, diagnosis, post-treatment, survivorship um, that someone is in. And they might also um, have different influence and importance across developmental transitions. So something that's important to a 15-year-old might be very different from something that's important to a 35-year-old. So again, this is a very multi-dimensional measure that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And um, the measurement of health-related quality of life varies and it incorporates, the, at least definition incorporates physical health, psychological, social, environmental, personal values, so a lot of different factors. However, again, um, those factors are likely to vary across cancer survivorship and across developmental stages for AYA survivors. So are we doing a really good job of measuring quality of life is one question. 
And I would say, you know, looking at the research that maybe not necessarily um, what survivors say and feel about their own quality of life might be a little bit different from the way and the tools that we have available to measure and assess their, their quality of life. So I say this as a caveat um, when talking about the quality of life outcomes um, in a moment to be thinking about. Um, and you can also see, uh, you can look online and find a lot of um, sort of quotes and pieces like the ones up here. These are just some that I've pulled over the past year or two that I wanted to highlight um, that kind of also get at the fact that um, young survivors don't always feel understood around the issues that they're dealing with after cancer. Um, that survivorship is really hard, that you would imagine going through treatment being the hardest thing that someone would have to deal with, but actually it's after the fact in survivorship where people really struggle, and that these are, these are hidden challenges for folks and they feel misunderstood. So the, you know, boy was I fooled when I thought going through surgeries and tests and making life-changing decisions was the hard part. Survivorship has been my biggest nemesis talking about depression, anxiety, and then throw on the menopause and you have a roller coaster of a ride, right? So I want to talk now about what we know about quality of life for this population. Here's what we know. <laughs> the AYA um, survivors' quality of life is poorer than um, AYAs who don't have cancer, right? And we've started to identify some high-risk groups here, and these are populations that we can think of as potential groups that um, would be ideal target populations for intervention. So transitions, so in particular, um, people have poorer quality of life when they're going through a transition, let's say out of treatment or back to work and school, that those tend to be tougher times. Of course, when they're in treatment and experiencing symptoms, those who lack health insurance, those who are younger, um, those who are Hispanic, have less education, females, and who have two or more cancers. So with what we know now, these are the groups who um, would tend to be at higher risk of having poorer quality of life overall. And again, I wanna mention that you know, the measures that we have to look at quality of life in this population aren't necessarily capturing the full construct of what quality of life means. So um, we may be missing some aspects of this, but this gives us at least a general idea of overall kind of how people's lives are be being affected by, um, by their cancer, uh, particularly their sort of physical and emotional well-being. So the next question I have is we know that there are these poorer quality of lives in poor quality of life in this population. So how can we help this population? So some possibilities from um, you know reviewing the literature and some of what we've been talking about today relates or not not just today but yesterday as well about these unmet needs that folks have informational, supportive, and even clinical care needs that this population has higher unmet need and that puts them at risk for poorer quality of life. They experience higher distress. So um, one and a half times more likely to report um, anxiety or depression than other AYAs without cancer. Uh, lower control over life and life goal disruption as well are factors that can contribute to poor quality of life for AYA survivors. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about reproductive and sexual health concerns. So, um, this is my area of research, and I do mixed methods research, so including um, sort of quantitative data collection as well as qualitative data collection. And this is where I feel you all would have probably heard a lot of this already from some of the speakers that have come before, but maybe this adds another layer of insight um, and reinforce some of these concepts. So this will not be um, a surprising quote to anyone in this room, but I'll read it to you. And the fertility issue is huge. That was the bigger blow than the cancer diagnosis was. The, oh my God, I can't have kids now. That was a way bigger blow than you have breast cancer because the breast cancer you treat and it's over with. And the fertility issue stays with you for life. It changes the whole course of your life. And you know the breast cancer is just a chapter in your life and then it's over and you keep going 
but to not have kids changes everything, so you know it's huge. I think this is probably not surprising to anyone in this room that we know that fertility impacts on a person's quality of life, and this is an important issue for AYA survivors as well. Um, but you might be surprised to know that I have um, you know, presented this quote um, in other settings with other groups of folks that aren't um, oncofertility oriented. And this is very surprising to people that it really is that important of an issue and potentially even more important than, than having um, cancer. And so some of my um, research has been around reproductive concerns uh, and just uh, by way of background, about 50 to 80 percent, depending on what survey you look at um, say that AYA survivors do want to have children, but that this is a complicated decision, right? It's not sort of an easy thing that you just decide and go ahead and do, that it might be a more distressing um, to think about and to um, experience reproductive distress for males than females. And we know, and you all know, that having these fertility discussions, consultations, opportunities for fertility preservation before treatment are really important. Um, but as well, I want to point out that those are not always accessible and are not always affordable. This is something I commonly hear in my sort of interviews and focus groups with young survivors is that was just too expensive. There was no way I could even consider that. Um, so it's um, great that this group is thinking about ways to make that more widely accessible and to have insurance cover these options. But at this point, for a lot of women at least, they're not really an option. So these are some um, data from a survey that we did with 18 to 35 year old female cancer survivors. And their average age was about um, 28 and most of them were within the first five years of their cancer um, diagnosis. And we asked them about their informational needs and care around fertility. So in this population, only 20% of them had had uh, fertility care before their treatment. So seen someone like a fertility consultant or fertility preservation. And only 40% said that they had received enough information and about an equal pr proportion said that they really needed information but they didn't know how to get information. And then um, I think this is the most important point on the slide here is that 64% felt really too overwhelmed to take in the information about fertility at the time of diagnosis. So I think this is a conundrum because we all know that we want to give information and options at the time of diagnosis, but also survivors and the people that are going through that experience are really overwhelmed at that time and it's really hard to absorb that information. So another possibility is to think about how can we meet them later on and talk with them after their treatment potentially. Um, in this survey we found that only 15% accessed fertility care after their treatment ended. And I'll also point out that most of the women who um, completed this survey uh, did want to have children, something like 80, 85% of them. So this is a population of cancer survivors who wants children but aren't accessing care. So I think this just points out an opportunity for um, I don't know, re uh, intervention for reaching this population that we're missing somehow, or not me personally, I'm not being a clinician, but potentially there are ways that we can um, help these people realize that this is an option to talk with someone even after their treatment ends. So another thing that I have worked on over the years is really trying to understand what the reproductive concerns of AYA cancer survivors are. Um, with some inkling that it wasn't just about fertility. And I was really happy walking around the posters yesterday when I saw that a few of the poster presentations, um, they were using this scale, which um, makes me really happy since I spent a long time working on it. Um, I also will note that this scale um, has been translated to, I think, seven languages now, and we've also created a male version for this. If, if this is something um, that you're interested in or an area of research, also, when I developed the scale, I had clinical use in mind as well. It's an 18-item scale and potentially can be used in a clinical setting to help identify people who have particular types of reproductive concerns to help direct conversations about those. So just to give you a sense of the different types of things that are covered in this scale, the first one is fertility. So for example, I'm afraid I won't be able to have any more children. Um, another one is communicating with the their spouse or partner about not being able to have children and worry about that. 
being afraid of their potential future child being unhealthy or passing on some genetic risk to their child. Um, and this was the case for all different types of cancer, not just those that would actually have a genetic risk. Being scared of not being around to take care of their children someday. So personal health concerns. Um, worrying that it's just going to be too hard to get pregnant. They don't want to deal with it anymore. And, and there was also a sentiment from several women that really um, they had reached a point of acceptance and they could accept whatever happens and they would be happy with it. So these are the different um, subscales within the reproductive concern scale. And in that same population of 18 to 35 year old female survivors, 65% uh, of them had moderate to high reproductive concerns overall um, using that scale and 10% had high concerns, so this is sort of, I would say, the highest risk group. And higher concerns, so high concerns were defined, um, this is a Likert scale from one to five of having a mean score of greater than four, so they would have had to agree or strongly agree with most of those um, concerns items. And higher scores are associated with higher odds of depression. And we know that this distress, these are cancer survivors, right, well after they've finished their treatment, and this distress uh, persists well into survivorship. So um, I think it's important to think about ways that we can help um, intervene in survivorship as well. Okay, so um, I'm doing some work now with couples. So I am interviewing um, AYA female uh, um, survivors and their partners around how they communicate with each other and their health care providers about um, fertility and parenthood issues, contraception, and sexual health. So I feel like this very much ties in with what we've been hearing about over these past couple of days. And, and some of this has been discussed already, um, so I'll just go over it quickly. But we know that young survivors are sexually active and they're not using contraception that's in line with what their parenthood goals are. And they're not um, often receiving adequate counseling around contraception and therefore they're at a higher risk of unintended pregnancy. Um, from a couple of recent studies, the, um, female survivors are less likely to use highly effective contraception and have a threefold greater risk of unintended pregnancy compared to the general population. And so in my conversations with these um, young women and their partners, um, this is one of their um, comments. This is a female survivor. I had my cycle back within three months post chemo, so maybe I was fertile then. You know, and here I am getting information that I don't need to use birth control, and obviously that was not good information, so I would start the conversation about contraception early. So the reason this is not good information is that this woman then went on to become pregnant and had twins, um, but had been told that she was infertile and she didn't need to use contraception. So this gets back to the point of the importance of talking with your patients about contraception and counseling them about their risk. And another one, my oncologist is not interested in anything that doesn't have to do with the cancer stuff. She just kind of brushes me off on contraception. I just feel like everywhere I go, someone's telling me to go to a different doctor. So um, again, I think this just gets at the idea of improved uh, patient provider communication around these issues, opening the conversation around this, asking that question, do you have any concerns about this so that people feel comfortable talking to you about it and not just brushing them off to this or that other doctor or specialist who you think that they should talk to. So with regard to sexual health, um, for AYA survivors, and this is just from a most recent study I could find, half of them experience a negative impact on sexual health from their cancer. And some higher risk groups are older than 25, not having children fatigue and have a negative impact on their appearance. And we know, and this has been discussed already in the past couple days, that these kind of sexual concerns are hard to talk about. It's often hard for the young survivor to bring it up, and it's hard for the healthcare provider to talk about it a lot of time, right? It's sensitive, or folks don't really know what they, what they should say or who they should refer to. So I feel like in this meeting, um, we've been given a lot of insight on some opportunities to um, make those conversations a little bit easier. We also know that cancer's impact on body image and intimate relationships are among the most prevalent in the AYA survivor population. And this is important, right? Relationships and communication that we've been talking about. And these impact on quality of life. So this is an important issue to address. 
is improved um, relationships and communications around sexual health. So a few quotes, again, from female survivors and the partner study I just mentioned. Um, talking about sexual concerns, this woman said, it kills me. I don't know how to fix it. Over the years, being on tamoxifen, that started to fade. Then I got on Lupron. All of that together, I have no libido, like zero, whereas before I had an extremely high libido. In addition to that, I've gained a lot of weight. I don't have any confidence in how I look and feel. It's been very painful, emotionally, physically, mentally, and I'm at an all-time low. It's one of the biggest problems in our relationship. It's extremely frustrating to both of us. So this is impacting on their relationship, on their quality of life. And again, highlighting this, no doctors ever brought it up. So this is a missed opportunity um, for healthcare providers just to bring up this issue and give uh, survivors an opportunity to talk about it. All right, so I'm gonna talk now about some possible approaches to improving quality of life. So one strategy I'm sure you're all familiar with is um, patient-centered care approach. And central to that is patient-centered communication. So this has been proposed as a strategy to help fill some of these information and supportive care gaps. And we know that young survivors do wanna have open discussions about these issues, about fertility, contraception, and sexual health. Um, and I'll point out that um, with patient-centered communication, it's not just about information exchange, right? It's also about shared decision-making and uh, managing uncertainty and emotions and bringing the family or the partner into those conversations as well. And this is um, from a young woman. I mean, I was embarrassed that they talked to me about fertility when I was 17, but at the same time, I'm glad that's always been something that I've known and can talk about. So it was embarrassing, but someone brought it up and she appreciated it. So uh, my colleagues and I recently did a very broad scoping review of the literature to look for interventions of, on any spectrum. It could be in the development stages. Um, we looked at qualitative and quantitative studies. So interventions that improve AYA, specifically AYA, survivor, provider, patient-centered communication. And we were specifically looking for a patient-centered communication outcome. So we found um, there are a lot of potential strategies that can be used to improve patient-centered communication, but very little evidence. Um, Given that these strategies are many in the earlier stages, descriptive, pilot, or feasibility studies with small sample sizes, and we found zero um, evidence-based interventions to improve patient-centered communication for AYA cancer survivors. So this is a gap in the literature currently. Um, I'll also point out that it's not clear, and there's no literature on this either, if patient-centered communication, improving that for AYA survivors will actually lead to improved quality of life in this population. So a second area um, where we need more research. So I thought it would be helpful to also talk about some other interventions that are out there, and this is not an expansive list with, of, of all of them, um, but just to highlight some that are available um, to improve not patient-centered communication per se, but psychosocial health outcomes and health promotion for AYA survivors. So along the lines of reproductive and sexual health distress, there are uh, the web-based program that was recently published that's a post-diagnosis program and there is fertility counseling, of course, and healthcare provider skill building. Um, in the arena of survivor education and empowerment, we have things like survivorship care plans and psychoeducation and support. Peer survivor events and activities are something that seems to be appealing and workable for the AYA population, things like the First Ascents Adventure Program. And lifestyle and health promotion, we have um, a couple interventions to promote physical activity and rehabilitation therapy as options. So just to kind of think a little bit more broadly beyond kind of the reproductive sexual health of ways that we can think about improving quality of life for this population. And for my own self, um, I have a couple things in progress that I'll just mention, and these are both at the stages of adapting and we will be feasibility testing, so I was really happy to hear about mindfulness come up um, in, the last, um, in the last group, and we are um, adapting a mindfulness-based intervention to support sexual health of female survivors right now with the goal of providing a safe, respectful environment for learning, psychological growth, uh, cultivation of present moment awareness, 
and to guide survivors through a connection or reconnection with their sexual interest. And this is an adaptation of uh, Lori Brado's work um, that she has developed and we're adapting that for cancer survivors. And as well, um, I have, as I mentioned, the ongoing um, dyadic communication study with young survivors and their partners. Um, and from that, we will be um, also adapting a program to promote communication between young survivors and their partners, um, specifically including components to focus on um, communication about reproductive and sexual health concerns after cancer. So I'm coming from a perspective of public health, so I like to think about things very broadly. Um, I would say um, we're kind of at the beginning of this. We don't really know what will work to improve quality of life for AYA survivors. We know a lot about the problem. We've studied the problem really well. So um, I, I do think that one thing we can think about is moving beyond just the, the patient provider perspective and thinking about how we can introduce interventions um, into the community that bring in family, partners, um, or parents, thinking about the peer survivor community as a potential level of intervention, and then health system level changes. I also uh, want to point out that there really are very few um, AYA survivorship studies that include underserved populations, so um, sex and gender minorities, racial ethnic minorities, these sorts of things, so to be mindful of that. And I'd like to think, um, I'm not in a medical center myself, I still maintain collaboration with um, folks in medical centers, but um, for me it's really important to think about how can we, do, how can we take what we know um, within the walls of a medical center and bring it beyond to the community of the real people out there that don't necessarily have access to these large academic medical centers. And finally, how can we work together to find some solutions um, and stop focusing so much on the problem and think about what would really help young survivors and what can we do together um, to help promote quality of life in this population. And finally, I'd like to thank my um, wonderful collaborators. I say most of the village because of course there's many, many other people involved in this work. Um, I work with folks at, um, in Oregon and, uh, and in San Diego. And thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was a really good summary and lead into the research that's needed. I'm wondering if you and others in the room have experienced what I've experienced, which is you know, maybe out of 200 cancer patients that we see in a year who become survivors, five are really interested in participating in research, coming to focus groups. Many of them, with the exception of breast cancer survivors, I'm talking about AYA, just want to get as far away from the cancer center and the cancer experience um, as they can, which makes it really challenging to develop these interventions or, or assess if an intervention has been ineffective because loss to follow up or even recruitment is so low. Yes. <laughs> I have struggled with recruitment as well. I've, I've had some success in the past through social media outreach um, to young survivors and that's worked pretty well. Um, since I'm not based in a medical center, I, um, I think that makes it harder for me in many ways to, I have to have clinical collaborators to help me recruit from clinic settings. Um, so I tend to look to cancer registries or social media or other strategies to try to identify young survivors. But I agree, it is a struggle to recruit this population. Um, yeah, I have a study, a survey of 18 to 35 year old male survivors that is just a survey, it's a 20 minute survey and I'm struggling to get male survivors to go and complete this survey. So yes, I can commiserate with that. <laughs> we have a pretty um, robust AYA population. I think you have to be really um, creative, like when you're going to engage them and incentivizing uh, survey completion has worked amazing. We give them 20 bucks to complete a survey and I think we've had one patient turn us down. 